You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Wednesday. What month are we in? June 20th, 2019. I'm Michael Brooks on a Michael slash Sam Wednesday. And this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA, on today's program. An interview that Sam just did with Letta Hong Fincher, portraying Big Brother, the feminist awakening in China. Fascinating conversation. Then, of course, we'll get to the news and the fun half. Iran's Revolutionary Guard has shot down a U.S. drone, as they say, after an endless series of provocations and lies by the Trump administration that their territory is their red line. Mike Pompeo is trying to assert that Iran works with Al-Qaeda, smacking in the face of all available logic and most, if not all, of the evidence. But it does, of course, reflect not only that the Trump administration would want to use the September 11th AUMF in an invasion or an attack on Iran, and also that People don't remember the lessons of history. The Al-Qaeda-Saddam Hussein connection was one of the prime lies of the Bush administration before the invasion of Iraq. In positive news, the House advances a vote to repeal that same AUMF under the leadership of Barbara Lee. Maduro and Venezuela have resisted U.S. efforts at regime change and a coup the administration apparently losing interest in Juan Guaido. Senate confirms a judge who attacked Roe v. Wade and called being transgender a delusion. Deutsche Bank faces criminal investigation for money laundering lapses in a very unsurprising story. It looks like in the beginning, the third way, the Wall Streetists, they said... No Sanders, no Warren. Well, it looks like they hate the old man so much that they're saying maybe Warren. And a potential reveal of some important political differences there. Joe Biden refuses to apologize for comments on segregation. Former Trump aide Hope Hicks frustrates Democrats with limited testimony. Bernie Sanders puts an innovative new worker ownership legislation and proposal back on the table even as the charter school industry goes to war against him. New revelations in the corrupt Lava Jato uh, investigation in Brazil that politically imprisoned Lula da Silva. It turns out they didn't investigate a former president, Enrique Cardozo, because he was a strong supporter of Lava Jato and politically aligned with them. Even as an academic that they targeted and maligned, who ended up committing suicide, is completely cleared on all charges as Sergio Moro, backed by corporations on the right in Brazil and the United States, is facing plummeting approval ratings in Brazil. HUD hires a former official at the center of a racial scandal. I think we're sensing a theme here, folks. And speaking of racial scandals, Tucker Carlson has a really deep question that everybody that takes racism seriously is going to have to answer sooner or later, which is how can this country be racist when Cory Booker is in the Senate? Deep, 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 deep. How can this country be racist when Frederick Douglass is giving speeches? That's a great question. Not only that, Frederick Douglass wrote a book, which is even assigned in some public schools. I mean, riddle me that. Apparently, I wonder if this meant that racism was completely done in the 70s when Edmund Burke represented Massachusetts. I guess probably, technically, at least according to the Charles Murray's types of the world, all of the external juice had been squeezed out because in the mid-1960s, after slavery and Jim Crow, 
uh, and housing discrimination, redlining, and policing across uh, the Midwest and the Northeast. In addition to that, you passed the Civil Rights Act. So I guess that was it by the 70s. Very deep, very historical way of looking at the world. Uh, Speaking of historical ways of looking at the world, Joe Biden uh, has been out making his case for the presidency. And I and I'm still going to maintain that while I think the last couple of weeks have been good from the profoundly necessary perspective of explaining exactly what Joe Biden's politics are, the damage that he has done in decades of politics, a damage that in the 1970s saw him fighting against Ted Kennedy on behalf of monopoly corporate interests. That saw saw him, in fact, in light of this clip, we should always remember everybody, fighting against desegregation efforts in the 1970s, all the way up until fighting against ACA covering contraception, voting for the Iraq invasion, the bankruptcy bill, and that's skipping literally hundreds of other things, literally, as Joe Biden would say. But he's been out talking about uh, a senator by the name of uh, uh, Eastland who was an arch segregationist and just an incredibly vicious bigot. Not an example of, I worked on arms control legislation with Richard Luger or something. This was, I got in the Senate in the 70s and I buddied up with an American apartheidist. And, you know, I guess credit where credit is due. Usually, the you know, and, and I think Joe Biden, of course, said some very nice personal things to say about Strom Thurmond as an example. I think people know of Strom Thurmond and Jesse Helms as two of the most disgusting, bigoted senators in modern American history. Senator Eastland is a little bit more indie and underground. Uh, so Joe Biden is reaching here. And this is also... At the same time that Joe Biden has made, at least on a couple of occasions, very misleading statements about marching for civil rights. So this is who this guy is. And, you know, the more we watch here and I'm going to keep it, you know, I'm not going to change my tune on this. I got to be honest about my analysis. Yes, of course, he could beat Donald Trump, but. Every day there is an accumulation of factors with this guy that becomes like, are the Democrats going to nominate once again, literally the only person, literally Joe Biden, that could lose to Donald Trump? Because this guy is a disaster. Here he is. Uh, maybe we'll play, I guess, uh, we'll play, actually we'll play Booker's comments second because I think it's, it's good to actually go in this order. Cory Booker is saying Joe Biden should apologize for talking about his partnership with an arch segregationist as an example of us all being able to have a cup of coffee together and do work. And here's Joe Biden. Just, I mean, he's brushing his shoulder off on Cory Booker here. Let's check it out from yesterday. You received from your fellow Democrats on the segregationist comments? The answer is yes. Here's the deal. What I was talking about, I could not have disagreed with Jim Eastland more. And the seg- he was a segregationist. I ran for the United States Senate because I disagreed with the views of the segregationists, the many of them in the Senate at the time. As I led the Judiciary Committee, I was able to pass what I was talking about was the Voting Rights Act. I was able to pass the Voting Rights Act while, when I was a young senator, when he was still the chairman, we voted against him and beat him in the Voting Rights Act. Secondly, when I was chairman of the committee, I extended the Voting Rights Act for 25 years, not five years. In addition to that, I made it very clear by the end, by the last time as I was on that committee, I was chairman of foreign relations, but I was a lead Democrat. We extended another 25 years and we got 98 out of 98 votes for it. The point I'm making is you don't have to agree. You don't have to like the people in terms of their views, but you just simply make the case and you beat them. You beat them without changing the system. How does it feel that uh, your Democratic rivals are implicitly saying that you have issues talking about race? They know better. Are you going to apologize like Cory Booker has called for? for what? Cory Booker has called for it. (laughs) He's asking you to apologize. (laughs) He knows better. Cory should. Not a racist bone in my body. I've been involved in civil rights my whole career. Period. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Now, as everybody in this office said when we first saw that clip, and I believe Brendan was the first one, um, well, let's just say there's a lot of different ways of being involved in civil rights. I think uh, Virgil, Texas, made the point that technically George Wallace was involved with civil rights. Yeah, a lot of people were involved. I mean, Strom Thurmond was involved in civil rights when he filibustered against it for over 24 hours. Uh, and Joe Biden was certainly involved in civil rights when he staked out the most reactionary Northeast enclave position you could possibly have as a 1970s Democrat against desegregating schools. Also, this frame that Biden puts, like, you don't have to agree with them. Yeah, we know we don't have to agree with them, Joe. We want to know about where you did agree with them. So when you say, I disagree with them about all sorts of things, well, did you agree with them about busing? Did you agree like, with them about schools? desegregating schools? Did you de- yeah, precisely. And why is it that you insist on touting your friendship with the guy? I mean, it's it, it, you're not even just saying, like, hey, look. Sometimes you got to work with really disgusting people to get things done in the context of the Senate. That See, this is another thing that's so amazing to me. Bernie Sanders works at Mike Lee to end the genocide in Yemen. Good for him. That's what you're supposed to do. Mike Lee's one of the worst people in Congress. If you can work with him to end the murder of people in Yemen, excellent. Joe Biden is saying... I was buddy buddy with a segregation. Like we we socialized borderline. He never called me boy. He never called me boy. Which uh, you know I don't even know if you need to read to understand why he might not have done that, Joe. And then in addition to that, we know that Joe Biden's record, in fact, was not pro civil rights in the seventies. Here's Cory Booker explaining why Biden should apologize. Are you going to apologize? Uh, you know, the vice president said I should know better, and this is what I know. As a black man in America, I know the deeply harmful and hurtful uh, usage of the word boy and how it was used to dehumanize and degrade. Um, I know that segregation is like the two people you are talking about through their laws and their language, uh, deeply wounded this nation, and the present-day manifestations of their work can still be seen in black and brown communities like the one I go home to. Uh, I know that somebody running for president of the United States, somebody running to be the leader of our party, should know that using the word boy in the way he did uh, can cause hurt and pain. And we need a presidential nominee and the leader of our party to be sensitive to that. And the last thing I know is, is (laughs) I know that I was raised to speak truth to power (laughs) and that I will never apologize for doing that. And vice president. President Biden shouldn't need this lesson. And at a time when we have from the highest offices in the land, uh, divisiveness, uh, racial hatred uh, and bigotry being spewed, um, he should have the sensitivity to know that this is a time I need to be an ally. I need to be a healer. I need to not engage in usage of words that will harm folks. And so this is deeply disappointing. We waited for him to apologize. He didn't uh, till the next day. And whether I'm running for president or not, as many people today have been on Juneteenth, no less, uh, calling out for the vice president to to acknowledge that his words were harmful and hurtful. I'm just this is very difficult because, look, Cory Booker is totally right in the context of this clip. I will say I much prefer the Bill de Blasio approach of yesterday uh, to dealing with this. And, you know, I, I will just say. And I know that he's doing the, you know, more in sadness than in anger. But uh, look up Cory Booker freaking out about the Obama reelect campaign's Bain ads. And he seems a whole lot more upset about criticizing private equity than Joe Biden's, uh, you know, fixation for segregation as senator. But being that as it may, he's correct. And, you know, Joe Biden, again, Joe Biden's also showing his entitlement here again, as ever. Um I'm gonna, we're going to get to this interview that Sam did um, in just a moment uh, with, uh, with Letta Hong Fincher. But first, got to let you know about one of today's sponsors. Whether it's muddy footprints or a pile of dishes after your first barbecue, nothing cleans like the spring scents from, Go- from Grove. Grove delivers natural brands you love, like Mrs. Meyer's Seventh Generation, Burt's Bees, and Grove straight to your doorstep. Everything is healthier for you and the planet, plus it really works. I recently loaded up on Mrs. Meyer's dish detergent and hand soap. 
no other brand I can use, both in terms of because of how sensitive my skin is, and also it smells great. It's like the opposite of some type of like, sometimes you go into people's uh, apartments and they've, they've done dishes and it's, it smells like some type of like, like, like some type of toxic waste or like some type of chemical thing has been released into the air. This is Myers smells natural. It smells normal. It's a nice scent, but it actually gets the job done a hundred percent. So things are incredibly clean. Right now, my listeners can take advantage of this exclusive spring uh, spring offer when you when you order when when you place your first order of twenty dollars, get a free three piece cleaning set and your favorite limited edition scent, peonia, lilac, or mint. That includes a Mrs. Myers spring hand soap, a Mrs. Myers spring dish soap. This is the stuff that I'm buying, a Mrs. Myers spring multi surface spray, and a Grove Collaborative cleaning caddy and a Glove and a Grove collaborative walnut scrubber sponges plus get a free 60 day VIP membership as well as a surprise bonus gift man they're hooking you up just go to grove.co slash majority to sign up and place an order of $20 or more that's grove.co not com co slash majority grove.co slash majority we're going to take a brief break. We're going to play this interview Sam did with Letta Hong Fincher, portraying Big Brother, the feminist awakening in China, and then we'll come back for the fun half. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program adjunct associate research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University, Leta Hong Fincher, for betraying Big Brother. The Feminist Awakening in China. Leda, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let's start. I mean, the, your book starts um, uh, several years ago, I guess, with, the, with, with what is known as uh, the Feminist Five. But before we do that, let's, let's go back to 1949 briefly, because um, theoretically, a communist revolution should theoretically... Um, wipe away, I guess, the the patriarchy in some respects. No? Uh, do I have that wrong? Uh, and, I mean, that clearly did not happen, but, but uh, speak to that. Sure. Well, actually, the Communist Party, when uh, it was originally founded in China in 1921, did really embrace feminism and gender equality. Um, and the the male founders of the party, including Mao Zedong, at the time uh, were pretty visionary with regard to women's status in society. And, um, and they used gender equality as a rallying call to mobilize women to join their revolution. Um, and so it, it, it was a really strong part of the revolution. And it was also a big part of the early communist era after the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. So, for example, gender equality is written into the Constitution of the People's Republic, um, and particularly in, in the 1950s and 60s, all the way through the late 70s, women were um, employed en masse. They were, it, it was, of course, a command economy, and the, the Communist Party put women to work in cities and in the countryside. And so female labor force participation was probably uh, or almost certainly the highest in the world. Um, and at the end of the 70s, you know, you had a female labor force participation rate in cities of around 90 percent, which is really astronomically high. So um, so in that respect, um, there there was still a lot of gender inequality, but because it was communist, because everybody was poor, the gap, the gender gap was not as large. Um, but, but during that time, women, even though, you know, um, there was this strong rhetoric, a lot of propaganda about how women hold up half the sky, which is one of Mao Zedong's most famous sayings, um, in spite of that rhetoric, you know, there was still a lot of sexism. Women were responsible for the household duties, 
taking care of the children and taking care of the elderly on top of having to go and work a, a full day in the fields or in factories. Um, and then it wasn't until you had the onset of market reforms in the 1980s and then picking up a lot more in the 1990s and the, two, and the uh, 2000s that um, as China became a lot wealthier, the gender inequality, particularly the gender wealth gap, just increased dramatically. Well, I mean, what I, I, I can imagine what contributes to the to the wealth gap, I guess, and that in the that um, women are still responsible for a whole host of other uh, responsibilities outside of work and therefore to, can't participate. Is that was that what what drove that wealth gap? I mean, uh, and and what else? I guess drove the um, why didn't economic I guess equality to the extent that it existed. Why was that? Why? Why was it? It feels like nothing was built upon that. Like there was still sort of societal uh, structures that that remained and were not implicated by that equality. Are we looking at just sort of like cultural things, or what? 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 what why didn't it work the way it should have? I guess. Well. Well. Um, well. In in part, it's because women never had true equality, even during the early communist era, um, when, you know, the Communist Party itself used gender equality more as a propaganda device. Um, but that said, of course, women were, were taking part in the workforce. So um, that itself was a real, I have to say, a real accomplishment of the Communist Party in those early years. So that there's that legacy of very strong female labor force participation and that work ethic, the expectation that women should be working outside the home, that that legacy is still very strong even today. Now, things today are extremely different. Um, the Communist Party today actually is pushing very retrograde gender norms and saying that women should return to the home and be very dutiful wives and mothers, um, you know, just leave all the work to the men. Um, and I write a lot about this in, um, in my book, Betraying Big Brother. And this is in, uh, uh, one of the main factors um, underlying the birth of this new feminist movement that I write about is just the, the background of increasing gender inequality. But another thing that I wrote about in my first book, Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China, I looked very closely at um, the privatization of housing and the creation of an enormous uh, pr private uh, real estate market, um, when, and it particularly um, in that transition from a planned economy to a market economy housing in the planned economy was allocated by the state. So it was basically, you know, a, an almost free benefit that everybody got. Um, and then when uh, the leadership decided to introduce market reforms, housing reform was a huge part of that. And so um, as housing became privatized, particularly in the early 2000s, because housing wasn't really formally privatized until the late 1990s, all of a sudden, housing became, uh, it went from being worth almost nothing to being worth within just a few years, um, you know, well over the equivalent of 30 trillion US dollars. Wow. So it was just this incredible, dramatic, and incredibly fast accumulation of wealth in the form of um, property assets. And that's where most Chinese people put their money is in, in their homes, in, in buying homes instead of having them allocated by the state. And I, I looked particularly in my first book, Leftover Women, very closely at the dynamics, the gender dynamics of purchasing housing. And um, it's really complicated, right. but basically money in the family tends to flow towards men 
um, as families buy homes and whether it's parents buying homes for their sons because they think that their son needs a home in order to attract a bride or it's, you know, um, young women who are getting married and then they're, they're handing over their life savings over to their boyfriend, you know, to buy a marital home, but then the home ends up only having the man's name on the property deed to all sorts of regulations and changes in the law that, that effectively shut women out of, of home ownership. So women are, have largely missed out on what is probably one of the biggest accumulations of pr- private property wealth in history. And, and how much, as we as we sort of transition into your latest book, how much of, of the sort of, of an awareness of we've just been left out of what, uh, at the very least, and I imagine it's a similar dynamic in, in China, um, is the greatest driver of intergenerational wealth uh, and of wealth, broadly speaking, which is you know real estate. Um, yes. How much of that was implicated in the sort of growing, I guess, um, um, movement of feminism, resurgence of feminism, as we get uh, into the early, I guess, teens? Um, well, well, actually... Be- because um, it's housing is so exorbitant in China relative to, I mean, it's even expensive by just purely by absolute American standards, but it's particularly expensive when you look at the relatively low average incomes in China. And so it's extremely unaffordable for a lot of people in China to buy homes, especially young people. Um, and so that uh, that that's definitely one of the grievances of of the young women that I write about. But um, uh, but for many of the young women, they don't they don't even um, can't even imagine owning their own homes. And so the the issues that concern these uh, urban, more educated women who've gone to college, those are the women who are really at, kind of at the core of the feminist movement right now. Um, the issues that those women are most concerned with now are things like gender discrimination in the workforce, in hiring. So employers now, it's, you know, it's definitely a very, um, you know, China's economy has grown at breakneck rates. And so it's a full almost full market economy now with very, well, there's still a lot of state interference, um, but employers routinely refuse to hire women and they even routinely um, advertise that they're only looking for men, even though that uh, it technically is illegal in China, but, but it's um, this kind of gender discrimination in hiring and, and in promotion is so common and then there's there's widespread gender discrimination in at university admissions as well. So um, so a lot of women, a, a lot of university programs say that women have to score higher on the university entrance exam than men in order to be admitted. Um, there there's a huge epidemic of sexual assault and sexual harassment. So um, that you know the global Me Too movement has really found a way to resonate very broadly in China as well, against all odds, I have to say. Well, um, I, I want to just talk about that aspect of it, and then I, I want you to tell us more about the Feminist Five. But um, sure. the because there's this sort of paradox that <clears throat> I mean, it it sounds like we have. Um, uh, uh, grievances of of women as they become, you know, sort of, um, I'm sure they're conscious of this the entire time, but I imagine on some level the Internet um, makes everyone or makes women more aware that they share these experiences, that it's not a function of them in particular or that there's something systemic that's going on, but it's also... Uh, the internet in China is not the internet as we know it 
here because it's just not that much access? Is it just a little bit goes a long way in terms of creating that? I mean, what about the internet um, sort of seems to have galvanized, I guess, a movement in China? Yeah. Yeah, well, this is this is what I find to be really, really fascinating because, of course, China has what they call the Great Firewall. You can't access, um, for example, you can't access YouTube or Google or Facebook or Twitter um, uh, or Instagram. They, China has its own intranet, so there's so much extensive censorship. Um, and not only is there censorship, but there's also monitoring and surveillance through the Internet. So um, the Internet is really dominated by, um, by the state. And yet in spite of that, it's also the Internet and social media that has actually been pretty successful in, in getting the feminist message out. And um, it, so, so it's remarkable to me that um, feminist activists in China, uh, especially since 2011 or 2012 in particular, have been incredibly resourceful and creative uh, in getting around the censorship and getting their message out and in mobilizing support in spite of all of this really aggressive interference um, with their communications. Um, what does that so take the to form? Get, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what does that take the form of? Like, what is it? Are they are memes that are sort of like ironic or I mean, how is that? How does that work on the Internet? Like, how do you get around those things? Or Right. Well, I mean, um, OK, just just to, to give you an example, but there used to be the most prominent um, social media platform for feminists in China used to be called feminist voices. And um, so they would distribute feminist content through like essays or artwork, um, you know, short films, videos. Um, They were actually banned last year on the night of International Women's Day, March 8th. So, but in spite of that, um, even though that was banned and it was also banned on, on, it was banned on China's equivalent of Twitter, which is Weibo, and then also banned on WeChat, which is this incredibly popular group messaging um, app. Um, but in spite of that, individual feminists were still using individual people's accounts to to get their message out about events that they were organizing um, or or just distributing feminist essays and so um, so one of the the ways in which they uh, were able to get around temporarily it's always temporary right. <laughs> getting around a uh, censorship is with the me too hashtag so me too kind of took off in China or began to take off in January of 2018 um, when a a Chinese graduate wrote a detailed account of how she had been abused by her former advisor in university. Um, And then, uh, and and using that hashtag, Me Too started to take off in China, and then more and more women started telling their own stories about sexual assault or sexual harassment. Um, and, but then the, the Me Too in China hashtag was blocked by censors. Then one feminist activist came up with the idea of using emojis for um, the Chinese character's Me Too, which sounds like Me Too. It, it means rice and bunny rabbit. And so they use the emojis rather than the words. Um, and so for a while, you know, people were using those pictures, the emojis for rice a rice bowl and a bunny rabbit um, to signify me too. Um, so that that's not a new strategy, really. I mean, because activists have been using that kind of, um, you know, a, a creative ways like that to, to try to get around censors before. But this was a, a particular strategy to spread me too messages I'm um, in the face of very aggressive censorship. I have to say that there was also a study done by University of Hong Kong looking at WeChat in 2018 and the top 10 most 
censored topics, and Me Too was was one of the one of them, which is really amazing given all of the other extremely politically sensitive topics that are really aggressively censored, like the Tiananmen massacre, for example, or right. Taiwan independence. Um, that it does indicate this incredible, I mean, um, certainly millions and millions of women, um, and, and also men as well, joining in um, and wanting to tell their stories and their experiences with, with sexual uh, assault or harassment of some kind. Um, but it's very difficult, and it's becoming increasingly difficult uh, as time goes by, but it, it's Still amazing. I mean, just a few weeks ago, another hashtag went viral about rape culture, and um, there were there were just uh, hundreds of thousands of women who were chiming in with um, the hashtag "Not Your Perfect Rape Victim," and this had to do with um, one woman accusing the CEO of a huge tech company in China. JD.com of having raped her. So it's still going on and it, it, it continues to amaze me given the incredibly extensive um, abilities of the, of the censorship and security apparatus. Well, tell us about the, the, the Feminist Five. Who were they? How did they um, uh, rise to some notoriety and... Um... What was the Chinese government reaction to them? Sure. Well, I consider the jailing of the Feminist Five in 2015 to be a real turning point for women's rights in China. Prior to that time, there were a pretty small number of feminist activists, I would say maybe about 100 in different Chinese cities who were holding um, acts of what they called performance art on the street to raise awareness about things like uh, sexual harassment or domestic violence. Um, but they weren't really hassled a lot by the police. They were, they were pretty marginalized. Nobody knew who they were. They didn't get much media attention. Actually, one of the actions that they held was called Occupy Men's Toilets in 2012, where they took over a public toilet in Guangzhou and uh, a public men's toilet and invited women in to use the stalls to draw attention to the fact that there aren't enough toilets for women. So they deliberately chose topics that they thought would not incur the wrath of, you know, China's um, security apparatus or police. And in fact, they received some pretty positive media attention from state agencies like the People's Daily at the time. So so that was the situation in, uh, in the beginning of 2015. Then a group of feminist activists decided they wanted to celebrate International Women's Day by handing out stickers about sexual harassment on subways and buses. They were going to do this on March 8th on International Women's Day. But a couple of days before that, the Chinese police launched a sweeping round of arrests in multiple cities and detained a lot of feminist activists. Then they ended up focusing on five young women and they brought all the women to a detention center in Beijing. And, um, and it looked like these women were going to be criminally prosecuted. Um, but then what the authorities did not anticipate was that there was going to be a huge amount of media attention um, uh, focused on these five jailed women. And so uh, there, there were so many news stories about it. There was a lot of diplomatic outrage. There were protests in support of the, the five women, and they became known as the Feminist Five. So they became quite famous during that time because the government was uh, trying to wipe out the possibility of a feminist movement. But, at the, it, but it drastically backfired. Um, the government ended up releasing these women after just 37 days in detention. And, um, and it was only after their release, I feel, that you had the beginnings of a truly powerful political women's rights movement. Um, and so I tell the stories of these five women, but also a lot of other feminist activists who were, who were really involved from the very beginning 
Um, and, and so their efforts, the efforts of these very courageous young women um, really paved the way for a much broader uh, um, kind of awakening among even very, you know, ordinary women, even even um, working class women now um, to some extent. But, but it's mainly women who um, have actually gone to college or are in college um, and also some, some, you know, older high school girls. Um, and, and it seems to me to be uh, a movement that is extremely difficult for the Chinese government to wipe out at this point because well, it's now more than, more than five years, uh, more than four years since the jailing of the feminist spy. Did they, did, did the Chinese government not, I mean, obviously they, they miscalculated, but, but I would imagine that part of the intent behind jailing five women of a burgeoning movement is basically the implicit threat. I mean, these five women, it, it seems to me that it was obviously disaggregated enough that these five women weren't necessarily pulling all the strings of the Chinese government didn't think like, oh, if we if we take these five players off the table, uh, their entire, uh, you know, sort of movement will collapse. They it seems to me that they would have thought like this is we're going to make an example. So if anybody decides that they want to do that, so did they? Well, how did they make that kind of miscalculation? Because like, what is it about the the movement that allowed them to make that miscalculation? Because I imagine they are well versed in stopping protest movements in this manner. Yes. Well, that's a very good question, and in fact. If you look at the whole history of social movements since um, the Tiananmen uprising of 1989, which was, you know, brutally suppressed in the June 4th massacre, um, ever since then, the government has been able to basically wipe out any um, really powerful social movement by jailing a lot of its leaders, um, and then. Um, so, so they actually thought that it would work in this case, that it would be, um, you know, threatening enough, that it would be frightening enough to other young women who might want to join a feminist movement. And, and remember, at the time, there really wasn't much of a feminist movement. There weren't a huge number of very active feminists at the time that the feminist five were jailed. It wasn't, um, it's that they, the government really did miscalculate. Um, they did not foresee that so many other women in China, um, young women, especially women who go to college or have recently graduated, just really care deeply about sexism. And, mm. and, that, and, and so, so that move backfired. And I think the government recognizes that's why we haven't seen a mass roundup, a mass jailing of women's rights activists since that time. And um, one thing that is, that is really different about the women's rights movement, and then that makes it very slippery, it's very hard for the government to control this movement, is that the messages of the feminist movement really resonate with many millions of young women all across China. Um, and these are issues that affect the daily lives of millions of women, you know, because most women um, have actually experienced sexual harassment or sexual assault of some kind or blatant gender discrimination or some, you know, um, ha have, have personally felt really aggrieved um, and are really angry about sexism. And in the past, they tended to keep that to themselves and they were mm. silent about it. But now there has been a critical mass of women who who see that they are not alone, that they don't, you know, they they see other women speaking out about injustice um, of some kind or another related to their sex. Um, and so, so more and more ordinary women are just springing up all over the country um, wanting to speak out and take a stand for women's rights and demand equality and demand justice. And so, so it's very hard for the government. They can't just 
jail hundreds of feminist activists and wipe out this movement because it's just gotten gotten too broad. Well, I mean, that's the thing that's sort of amazing, because as we as we talk, there are anywhere from one to three million uh, Muslim Uyghurs in um, in camps in China. Um, right. And so the the capacity of the government to um, to arrest that many people seems to be quite clear. Right. And to yes. uh, and and also, uh, you know, we have the example of the Fulin Gong, which I think is probably more of like tens of thousands or thousands. Um, right. But it it seems they're they they they're up against a different um a different thing here in terms of yeah. like how broadly this permeates Chinese culture. And um, so with that said, what happens now? I mean, if they don't have the ability to round up a million women, let's say. Well, uh, they do have the ability, well, but they're not doing it they, because they recognize that that would backfire on them. Right. Um so can I have, can I just say can please. I just uh, address your points earlier about the you know the mass detention of Uyghurs, which is um, I mean a, a, clearly a huge atrocity. The thing is that um, it would be very very difficult to get a lot of good media coverage of that issue, um, and that's one big obstacle. Um, and another is that because they're Uyghur Muslims, very sadly. You know, the Han Chinese people, by and large, just don't care that much. Mm. Or, they, or they believe the government line that these Uyghurs are not, you know, in, uh, in concentration camps or detention or in, they're not being held uh, incarcerated. They're, they are being re-educated, right. which is the term that the Chinese government uses. So, um, and we should add our own State Department, apparently. Our own, well, our our own State Department. Well, I think, or I should say, State Mike Department. Pompeo. Uh, when he goes on, let me be more specific. Mike Pompeo specifically referred to them as re-education camps. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, language is very political, and so the kind of language that you use is really important. And so, you know, it, it, it from the media reports and the research that has been done, it's pretty clear. These are not, you know, innocuous schools. These are these are prisons. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there hasn't been incredibly strong condemnation of these camps for Uyghurs from governments. Um, not even from, you know, Muslim countries. Almost none of them have spoken out except for Turkey, and uh, as far as I know. Um, and then, and then, if you're looking at the Han Chinese population, which is the majority of overwhelming majority of the Chinese population is Han Chinese. They are themselves, of course, you know, um, indoctrinated by the propaganda. They don't have access right. to information about the conditions for these Uyghurs who are held in these camps. And so they don't. So, so this isn't something that's going to gain a lot of traction um, with the majority of Han Chinese people. Um, so the difference is that, well, with with the feminist movement, it relates to the rights of half of China's population, um, and uh, and it's also the the nature of that that population as well. The 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 women who tend most uh, to most identify as feminists are Han Chinese themselves who are in college or have recently graduated from college or are in graduate school. So it's more of an urban educated Han Chinese uh, uh, population of women. Now, these women are being coerced by the government so far through only propaganda but um, the government recently uh, got rid of its so-called one-child policy, and it now has adopted a two-child policy. And it is strongly trying to push these educated Han Chinese women into getting married and having two babies for the good of the nation. So that's another very tricky thing for the government is on the one hand, 
you know, it is very worried about um, the women's rights movement. It's trying to get rid of the movement without jailing large numbers of activists. But on the other hand, you know, it's trying to co-opt those women. It's trying to co-opt them and convince them to have babies. So I think so far the government hasn't figured out really what it should do um, because the birth rates um, in China have been falling really precipitously. And so more and more young women um, don't want to have even one baby, let alone two babies. And so that's sort of a yes. twofer for them, I would imagine, insofar as, I mean, no pun intended, insofar as um, it's it's much harder, uh, frankly, I would imagine, to maintain a movement if you've also got to take care of your two kids. Well, well, I mean, well, that, I mean that that's one of the reasons as well why why the women are increasingly standing up for their rights because they don't want to be seen as simply reproductive tools of the government, which is what what they are. I, I mean that that is what the government um, that's how the government treats these women as just biological vessels for the delivery of babies for you know China's. Um, future development, and um, and women don't want to be treated that way anymore. Young women don't want that for the most part. So um, they, yeah. Oh well, I was just going to say because uh, we're, we're to wrap up. Like, wh- where do you think this goes? I mean, if they don't, they have the capacity, but they realize that it, they don't have the 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 room or the latitude, or um, it would not be a successful endeavor to round up half a million women who they suspect it would be the sort of like, you know, the leaders in the middle management uh, or, you know, the people who are, 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 uh, you know, tweeting out um, uh, memes that suggest the me too movement or something like this. Like what, where does this go? I mean, if, is there, is, is reform uh, inevitable or, can they sort of, I don't know, tread water like this? Well, it's, reform is certainly not inevitable. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so many people thought that um, after the Tiananmen Massacre and the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and across Eastern Europe, that it, communism would eventually collapse in China, and it was just a matter of time uh, before China introduced political reforms along with economic reforms. But today we see... The opposite is happening. Actually, there's been a huge retrenchment, um, a huge increase in very repressive authoritarianism with, um, for example, Xi Jinping, the, the president, has abolished presidential term limits so he, he could be ruler for life. Um, and, and things are becoming much more repressive on the ground for everybody in China, for all activists. So it's a, overall, it's a really bleak situation for social movements with the notable exception of the women's rights movement thus far. But, you know, I can't, nobody can predict what's going to happen next. I mean, it's possible that the government may decide, well, you know what, let's take that risk. Let It's time that we really crack down hard on these feminist activists and, and we threw a large number of them in jail. Um, that's entirely possible. It's entirely uh, within, uh, certainly within the means of the Chinese government to do that. Um, I, I, uh, I don't know. Um, all I know is that, you know, it's a, it's a very volatile situation and this confrontation between an incredibly misogynistic and increasingly authoritarian Communist Party state on the one hand that's trying to push women, Han Chinese women into having more babies, um, that confrontation, and then more uh, the, the gr- on the ground, more and more young women, especially women who are educated, are pushing back against um, government interference. Um, that confrontation is going to continue for, for quite a long time. Um, and so I, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Uh, the book is Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China. Leda Hong Fincher, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for having me.
Welcome back, folks. Really interesting interview. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm pretty concerned right now. Uh, I'm seeing reports in Politico that congressional leaders have been called to the Situation Room. Um, there is this drumbeat. There is this relentless instigation of Iran. There's the relentless lying that parallels Vietnam and Iraq. Uh, very concerning. Um, I'll specifically deal with some of the basic debunk that needs to be done about this idea that Iran is somehow tightly affiliated with Al Qaeda. That's, I mean, that's anywhere from, if you want it to be super diplomatic, highly misleading to, you know, deranged lying propaganda, which is how we should probably call it, uh, what we should probably call it. So we have to get to that. Uh, with what's going on with Iran. Apparently, good news from the Senate. There was just a, a vote to block a Saudi, Saudi arms sale, but not uh, not enough to uh, override a presidential veto, which will sure to become from this uh, administration, but nonetheless, a decent step there. So a lot to get to in the fun half. Um, on the Michael Brooks show on Tuesday, Alona Minkowski co-hosted. We actually talked about this CIA Iran group uh, which has been remade in the image of this major player in the drone wars, Mike D'Andrea, uh, D'Andrea in the Trump era, and its role in no doubt escalating and propagandizing you know, these really extreme del- dangerous elements that want conflict with Iran. We covered a bunch of other stuff, and there and we did an analysis using Marx of Bernie Sanders' Democratic Socialism speech. This weekend, Brian Grimm and I are doing an illicit history of his book on the modern history of the Democratic Party with a sort of sound arc, as we usually do in illicit histories, that will take you through Jesse Jackson, Jerry Brown, through Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, and a whole bunch more. A very detailed, fascinating history there. I think we'll probably unlock that one. That will be a kind of dose of what you get as a patron. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Go subscribe to Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. Matt, literary hangover. Oh, I'm sorry. Buy your tickets to the Chicago Live Show, August 24th. TMBS. Very excited about it. More info coming soon. Sorry, Matt. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, literary hangover. We're going to have a massive uh, episode out uh, for the pub for everybody on Saturday on the Blythedale Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne, which is a sort of satire loosely based on the Brook Farm Commune uh, in Massachusetts. So he's uh, uh, taken aim at the early utopian communists. Uh, if anybody hasn't listened to the Margaret Fuller episode, listen to that one first because uh, one of the characters is based on Margaret Fuller uh, in large part. Fascinating. Of course, check out Jamie's The Antifada, um, everything that they're doing there as well. Today's show was brought to you in part by To Hunt a Killer. Introducing Hunt a Killer. Let me reset that. Final note for today's show, Introducing Hunt a Killer, a monthly subscription game where you become a detective immersed in a murder mystery. It's so interactive and convincing that it looks and feels real. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to huntakiller.com slash majority for 20% off your first box. They only accept 200 members per day, so hurry up to take advantage of this offer. That's huntakiller.com slash majority for 20 off of your first box. Huntakiller.com slash majority. We're going to go to the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, 
38, 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you. You fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, gonna take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You yes, think I might uh, be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. Do. <laughs> Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly.